Jeffrey, it's, uh, it's always an honor to, to get some time with you. Thank you for agreeing to doing this conference. I know you're a very busy guy. And you know one vibe from inside this room here in New York City, Jeffrey, it's a, a lot of folks, I think, are concerned about how far the Federal Reserve has come uh, on interest rates uh, and also concerned on how long they may hold interest rates at current levels. How, how concerned are you about what the Federal Reserve has done? Well, I, I think they had to raise interest rates because of their uh, delay in beginning raising interest rates and how slow they began. If only they had followed my advice in March of last year uh, to raise interest rates, not 25 or 50 basis points when they lifted off, but 200, I think we'd be in a much better place. We probably wouldn't have to be up at this level. But you know, the yield curve is inverted, it has been, it's now de-inverting, it's flat. We have the unemployment rate is above its 12 month moving average. We have consumer confidence in the present is deteriorating. Uh, and it's always sort of cautious about the future, but usually uh, they're optimistic about the, the present, but that's starting to fade. So we have a lot of, of, of major indicators that have been in recessionary signaling for a year plus. And so I think the uh, Fed has stopped raising interest rates. I don't think we're gonna do it again. That's clearly the message from the bond market. The thing that worries me the most is the concept of higher for longer and not so much for the economy because once the economy uh, starts to noticeably weaken and it seems like that's almost happening in real time but once that happens the fed will cut interest rates the bond market's forecast is has been at odds with the fed's movements and the fed's dot plots for much of this year and now the uh, bond market's internal pricing suggests that the fed will cut rates 50 basis points or maybe five eighths of 1% during 2024. I, I believe that's the one thing that is not going to happen. I think they'll either stay higher for longer, which is their rhetoric, and I hope they don't, or the economy will noticeably weaken and they'll do what they always do, and that is cut interest rates much more rapidly than they raise them. I like to use the phrase, the Fed uh, takes the, uh, the stairs up and the elevator down when it comes to interest rates. So the reason I'm worried about higher for longer is something that's already in evidence, but isn't getting enough attention. The interest expense on the debt is exploding in a vertical fashion because all of those bonds that were issued back at 25 to 50 basis point interest rates, or maybe uh, only as high as 1%, they're all rolling off and they're rolling off with great speed. So you'd have to reinvest those bonds that were paying almost nothing at an interest rate of, well, if, at the Fed funds rate is five and three eighths percent. And that leads to a tremendous increase in interest expense of the debt. Already, the interest expense since the Fed started raising interest rates has gone up by hundreds of billions of dollars, almost half a trillion dollars per year. Yeah. And it's going literally vertical. And we have 30% of all of the bonds in the national debt, which is now $33.7 trillion. Not all of them are held by the public. Certainly the Fed owns about a little under 8 trillion of them. But all of these bonds, about 17 trillion of them come due over the next 36 months. Yeah. So that means that if we keep interest rates higher for longer, these bonds that yield, you know, sort of one or 2% are going to be, uh, re you know, reissued at 300 basis points or more higher interest rates. And on 17 trillion, that's another 500 mm -hmm. you know, billion dollars. So we have a massive problem that's coming, look, that we're staring down because of the low interest rates being in place for so many uh, years, almost a decade, mm -hmm. and now the Fed being higher for longer. And this is happening also to small businesses who used to pay 4%, and now they're paying 9 or even 12%, which is obviously another problem if we're higher for longer because a lot of people can bridge a gap of temporary inflated interest expense, but not if we're gonna be higher for longer. Je so my, my belief is that we're going to be in recession. If we're not already in recession, mm -hmm. we'll probably be in a recession uh, by the second quarter of 2024. Jeffrey, I can tell you you're not alone. Uh, before you came on, before you came on our, our screen, uh, we just talked to AT&T CEO John Stanky company with a lot of debt, but he voiced his concerns about the fiscal situation in, in this country. So when I hear you say in this room here uh, in New York City, here's you say there might be a recession next year. What is your best advice 
to investors, where do they go? Well, you should be up in quality. You, you, right now, there's a strange level place to stand because I think in a Pavlovian sense, which you've already started to see happening over the past week, that when people are getting more inclined to believe that the economy is softening, they have a Pavlovian response uh, born of 40 years of experience of falling interest rates on a secular basis that you just automatically want to buy bonds. You want, you want to upgrade in credit quality, and that's working. I mean, bonds have done really well over the past week. Stocks have done well, too, because they needed bonds uh, to do well, to, to uh, kind of uh, stop falling, uh, which happened over the last, the last few months. But I think what most investors are going to be surprised by is while interest rates will probably fall in an automatic reaction to weaker economic growth, I don't think they're going to stay low because of the supply problem. This fiscal problem is going to get much, much worse in a recession because, of course, there's going to be a strong response. It's going to be probably an inflationary response to uh, this, this, this fiscal situation. And so weirdly, I think we're going to have higher interest rates uh, uh, in the aftermath of the recessionary response. So we may actually have lower interest rates in the first half of 2024, which I think is likely it's already begun. But then interestingly, we might have to pivot to the re reality of a, I don't know, uh, debt to GDP, which is now running at six to eight uh, percent, which is already incredibly high, given the idea that people think the economy is pretty decent. We could easily see the, uh, the deficit go to nine percent of GDP. And it, it, when you start to look at the arithmetic of all of this, it's really uh, rather rather troubling. I mean, like I said, 36 percent of the debt rolls off, uh, half of the debt rolls off for the next 36 months. But what if the deficit is 9 percent of GDP? And what if interest rates are at 6 percent instead of at 3 percent, which is the average yield on the entire Treasury debt? Stuff that's rolling off in the next 36 months probably has a lower interest rate than the 3 percent average across the curve. But you can just start to see what's going to happen to the interest expense. And in five years, let's just say we go higher for longer and we have a, a 6 percent uh, interest rate and we have 9 percent uh, of, of uh, de deficits per GDP. Amazingly, by 2028, using the CBO's own assumptions, which are probably overly optimistic, 50 percent of all tax receipts would be going to debt payments, which, of course, is an impossibility, given that 70 percent of the of the of the budget is mandatory spending. You can't have half of it going to interest rate expense. So this is really, we're really getting to that moment that we've all been, uh, us old timers have been talking about for decades. We, it used to be when I was maybe 10 years into this business, it used to be, well, we all know that we're on an unsustainable path, but it's really gonna hit the fan in about 2050. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was 2040, and now the CBO themselves and the Social Security trustees themselves acknowledge that they're out of money in about seven years. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming no recession. So we're basically at the, that moment where it's not our grandchildren's problem, it's not our children's problem, it's our problem. Yeah. And uh, what investors have been trained to think they understand is a secularly falling interest rate regime. Because even if you've been around for 40 years like me, you've broadly experienced falling interest rates and oftentimes of some significance. And our entire economy is debt uh, is based on debt. And you know, one thing that investors think they know is how relationships hold. Mm -hmm. When you're in recessions, interest rates fall. You know, when uh, when you get, uh, companies get stressed, they're able to refinance because you're in a secular falling interest rate environment. But you're not anymore. Yeah. Interest rates are not falling anymore on a secular basis. They actually bottomed out between 2016 and around 2020. And uh, what will happen if you can't refinance and you would go into recession and interest rates aren't down, but they're up? I mean, these, these are things that people have to open their mind to. It's almost like a, a metaphor that is already happening in real time for the housing market. You know, people thought that interest rates on mortgages going from roughly 3% to roughly 8% would be crippling for the housing market. Well, it's been crippling for uh, existing home turnover because there's no supply because nobody that has a mortgage at 3% wants to sell their house yeah. and take out a mortgage at 8%, yeah. right? So the, the housing market has held up remarkably in terms of its pricing due to no supply. Mm -hmm. So the interest rates have gone up, but the prices have stayed up. In fact, the Case-Shiller uh, 10 city index is actually at a new high. 
Yeah. So home affordability is at an all time low. So all of our lives have been geared to low interest rates. And now that we start to uh, understand that higher interest rates have a consequence, I think that this idea that we're going to avoid a recession mm -hmm. is, uh, is really losing steam, uh, thanks to, in particular, the uh, employment data that came out mm -hmm. on Friday, which was definitely weak. But 34% yeah. of the jobs, even though there were only about 100,000 jobs officially created, 34% of them were government jobs. Yeah. So there were hardly any private sector jobs. And there's another survey that doesn't get as much play, which is called the household survey. And it actually has been showing job losses. Mm -hmm. So there's this weird uh, behavior in the labor data that I'm starting to get suspicious about. Mm -hmm. And that is that we get these, these jobs reports and they, they tend to look fairly good until the most recent one. But strangely, there's revisions uh, that go back a few months. So the revisions that came out on Friday actually showed that the, the job market wasn't as strong. And I'm starting to get cynical about some of this government data. I'm wondering if they don't intentionally over-report the, the first uh, headline data number on the first Friday of a month for the preceding month so that we can get sound bites from politicians to say, hey, look, a great jobs report. Yeah. And then they sweep under the rug the fact that there's revisions in the past. So, Jeffrey. So, so I, I, I'm very I'm very sober about what's really going on in the economy. And I think a, a lot of Wall Street talking heads mm -hmm. are looking at backward looking data and not being honest intellectually about what's coming in the future. So I hear you uh, really putting forth the case, Jeffrey, of, of economy that could hit a recession next year it's slowing, deficits are out of control. So my question to you is, does that argue the need for a Republican in the White House, someone that may want to wrangle and get down government spending? Because I think a lot of folks in the Wall Street community will acknowledge that this current administration has spent a ton, infrastructure, EVs, you name it, that has contributed to the deficit. Well, I wish they'd actually spent things, spent the money on the things that you, you uh, just listed. I'm pretty sure a lot of the money gets wasted. I'm sure a lot of the money gets uh, disappears. I know a lot of the money we've sent to Ukraine, for example, the, the Ukrainian officials say that they're, 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 the money is disappearing. They're, they're stealing it like there's no tomorrow. So we're not really investing the money, but a Republican coming into the office, how's that gonna help? Mm. We run up these deficits under every administration. Uh, it's basically a disease that we we believe that we can run a $2 trillion budget deficit in perpetuity. Uh, and so I think, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's a Republican versus Democrat issue. I think it's a mathematician versus pseudo economist issue. And I'm a mathematician and that's what I've been trying to outline uh, so far in this conversation. But the politicians, they actually have put out ideas like modern monetary theory which you notice how that's disappeared. That was that was about five years ago. The idea was you could spend endless amounts of money and they had some bizarre theory that it wouldn't cause inflation. I think all those guys have gone back into their rat hole because <laughs> obviously got inflation when we spent a four and a half trillion dollars, which supposedly under modern monetary theory wouldn't have had a problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what we need is a mathematician and, and, and not, not a supply side uh, economist mm -hmm. uh, in, in power. And that will ultimately happen, but it, it, mm -hmm. people have to really experience it, an, uh, you know, a, a, a crack of doom sort of a moment that they, they realize uh, that this is not sustainable. I, I, I saw an article today about WeWork. Mm -hmm. You know, WeWork had a 40 odd, $47 billion uh, market cap uh, five years ago, four years ago in 2019. And now that they have liabilities that exceed their assets, mm -hmm. so they're filing for bankruptcy and restructuring. You know, uh, there had to be a moment for, I mean, when you were at $47 billion market cap for a company that had been around for only 10 years or so, I'm sure that the the C-suite was popping the champagne corks and living large. I think they bought a Gulfstream. I don't know if it was- <laughs> I'm sure they did. But, <laughs> but you know, and, and there had to be a moment where the C-suite at WeWork had this crack of doom and said, oh my God, you know, we, we are bleeding money and there is no possible way that we can stay on this path. Yep. Well, I, I've, I've had my crack of doom moment about the U.S. finances, uh, and it really came in 2020, for sure, where I realized that we had crossed the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. But it's a Republican is not going to help. We need somebody that wants. We need somebody that is going to. Okay, if the Republican runs on zero budget deficit, mm -hmm. 
then I'll take them seriously. <laughs> Fair. That's what we need. We again, some to, again, some applause here in the room, Jeff. You're getting some applause. And you know, look, we've got about two minutes left, and it's very rare, I think, for a lot of folks in the room and the millions around the world watching this in the stream to get direct access to you. And that's what it feels like just being in this room. My question to you, lastly, is on this. What is your message to those investors that essentially have concentrated their wealth in seven of the world's biggest stocks, otherwise known as the Magnificent Seven? What is your message to them? Are they playing with absolute fire? Of course. There will obviously be the worst performers in the upcoming recession. Whatever, whatever is the leading the charge going into the economic downturn invariably must lead the charge on the way down. I would go into an equal weighted basket as opposed to a market weighted basket. I would be moving away from US uh, banking system for sure, because the US banking system, although people are uh, touting it from time to time, the banks are losing a ton of money. Uh, one large bank in America, I won't name their name, but they've got about a trillion dollar investment portfolio and it's kicking off 3%. But the borrowing cost at the Fed is over five and three eighths. So you want to stay away from all of these things that are debt based. So I would go for manufacturing as opposed to finance. I would go for equal weighted versus market weighted. And I would be going towards uh, uh, gradually uh, diversifying and it's, it's it's, it hasn't really been a good idea, but it's probably time to start diversifying on like a dollar cost averaging basis into non-US uh, equities. In particular, I would start thinking about emerging markets once the dollar index starts to fall, which has not happened yet, mm -hmm. but it's going to happen in the next recession. Well, it's uh, always uh, great to, it's a real treat to get some time with you, uh, Jeffrey Gunlock Docs. So I know you're a busy guy, I know you're out there doing some, uh, some stuff. It's great to get this uh, really interesting insight from you. Double line. Founder and CEO Jeffrey Gunlock, thanks for uh, making time for us. Uh, as always, really appreciate it.